Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm your regular host, Greg Carr, and this is our weekly hour devoted to issues of particular concern to people of African descent and to others fighting to build a better society. Um, as we know, we've had a range of folk in, in our weekly conversation over the arc of the show's life, and we wanted to devote particular attention today to movement building. 
to coalition politics, to how the struggle of the previous generations of African people, whether it be the Black Power Movement, the social justice movements, beginning, quite frankly, from when we were snatched out of Africa and continuing through today, inform the multi-layered politics of today, particularly around issues of common concern to all of us as human beings, but being anchored firmly in, um, in concern to those who are the most vulnerable in our society. And so to do that today, uh, we've invited to the table a, a long distance runner, a, a freedom fighter who still in the prime of her stride represents the best in those struggle traditions and the best in those victorious traditions. And that's none other than Monifa Akamwole Bandele, who is a senior vice president for and chief strategy officer for Moms Rising, and who is also directs uh, their reproductive uh, justice work has done a, number, a lot of work around maternal health and children, um, done work around the criminal justice system. Uh, I guess you could call it reforming, but really remaking in many ways. She sits at the policy table and leadership team of the Movement for Black Lives and uh, has a number, wears a number of hats, does a, 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 great, a, great, a great amount of work across the range. Today, she's joined us to talk particularly around these issues of maternal health and we want to welcome her to the table. Welcome, Manifa. It's good to have you here at the Black Table. Thank you. It's so great to be here oh, yes. with well, you and with your audience. <laughs> our <laughs> audience, our people, because uh, <laughs> we understand Mom's Rising and we'll, we'll get into that. And by the way, those of you who are watching from around the world, you need to tee up that website, momsrising.org. Might as well go on and put that in and bookmark that right now so we can uh, we can we can have that there so you can you can do that. But uh, in addition to the million plus that you have organized, uh, I saw several thousand bloggers in the army uh, on the ground and online, as you all describe it, in terms of, of moms rising. Talk to us about maternal deaths, because I know that's one of the, the anchoring issues of the formation and, and why we should really be kind of pausing and anchoring ourselves in this crisis, uh, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if people knew, I think we would have a lot more action happening. The United States is the most dangerous place to give birth amongst what they call industrialized nations. So basically, if you look at all the wealthy nations around the world, the United States actually ranks dead last in terms of maternal health outcomes. We have the highest number of maternal mortality, which is like death during um, labor, delivery, and, up and postpartum and also maternal morbidity, which is coming close to dying or having severe and chronic long-term um, impacts after giving birth. And so we have, to, we have to, one, say, this is something that is impacting everyone who is seeking to or in the process of giving birth you know, in the United States. But then when you peel back a la layer, you see a whole other crisis, which is a black maternal health crisis, right? One of the drivers of this high maternal death rate for the entire country are the high rates of black women and indigenous women who are not surviving the very basic um, and sacred process of giving birth right, to, to another human being. And so at Moms Rising, we were fighting to sound the alarm on this you know, for almost 10 years. It's been a trend uh, that we've noticed through stories that our members tell us but also through the states that were collecting data. And then in 2017, we helped pass a law called the Preventing Maternal Deaths Act, which made all states count their maternal mortality rate. It was not happening. You know, mm. if someone died while giving birth and let's say they had a stroke or they had a heart attack, their death certificate might read that they died because of a heart attack mm. or a stroke and not, you know, maternal mortality. So now that we're collecting the data, and we really see what's going on. We see that black women um, die at a rate three to four times higher than our white counterparts. And this is irrespective of education, health, income. A lot of people know the story of Serena Williams. She tells her story yeah. about childbirth being ignored, not being listened to as a black woman. And it was so triggering. We got thousands of stories when she shared her stories because everyone was like, me too. This happened to me too but, when man, I was can, in the hospital. Can I ask you about that? That is, um, I'm sure that's news to sadly too many of us who are hearing you for the first time on this. You're saying class may be a factor, but it's not 
the fact that we might think it is. So it isn't just access to health care. It isn't just going. That is something because she has a, every available resource. So so what is what is what's going on here? With, if, if you take class out and it's still happening, why is this happening? Why is it happening? Yes. We know that these health care systems are inherently racist. Um, there are a lot of white supremacist ideas and mythologies around black women, black women's bodies, even black people that we experience painless. Right. Mm-hmm. Our pain is dismissed. We recently learned, you know, they've they've adjusted the donor criteria for kidney functions. It, there was a higher threshold for black people to receive a donation for uh, to receive a kidney if they needed one than white people because there was a different metric. Uh, this was all embedded in racism that existed up until last year. So we know that these these um, we know that it is racism is a part of it. And when you combine that with everything that we know is already wrong with the healthcare system, lack of access, not really having a good public health infrastructure, then you get the crisis that you've seen. And the point I was about to make is that the CDC released a report now last month saying that not only is the maternal mortality rate continuing to increase, it jumped in 2001 and in in 2022, it rose like 20% which is a huge increase. So we're going in the opposite direction of what they call, quote unquote, third world nations, where their maternal mortality rate is going down. The United States is going up. Yeah, and, and um, you know, in the article that you uh, focused us on from February uh, of this year on the pandemic, um, one of the sisters that was highlighted, Shanice Wallace, died in 2020 from pregnancy complications after delivery and she's a medical doctor it's a doctor i mean it's, it's, it's like well if anybody were i'm just now i'm thinking about all of the physicians that we know certainly not nearly enough you know coming out of places like Meharry and morehouse school of medicine and howard and charles drew and other places who you know we don't have enough but but i guess it's, it's a lot deeper than that huh this shouldn't be about just black doctors every doctor please jump in Doctors weren't the ones initially who who uh, helped uh, people give birth. It was black midwives in this country. Black midwives were birthing the babies, Absolutely. both of our own families in our communities, as well as the people who were the slave owners. So we were the birthing professionals. And then as it got medicalized, right, and as, as the corporate interest moved in, you saw that birthing now became something that was done by doctors. And midwives in many states were outlawed, right? Mm. So all of a sudden we didn't have access to our birth practitioners. Mm. And now when midwifery has become popular again, it's so expensive that black women can't access it, right? With oh. A lot of times you can't afford to have a midwife and a doula in there. That's like a luxury item. So, so it's, can, it's mm-hmm. no, no. Can we, can we, can we talk about that a little bit? Because I know one of the things that, that your work encompasses, including with, with Moms Rising, is impacting policy and public policy. Is this a question of licensure? Because as you said, at one time, it was nothing but black women delivering babies, obviously under duress. But so black women, women who want to be doulas, particularly black, brown women, other who want to be doulas, who want to be midwives, are there barriers, structural barriers? And how do we intervene in a policy way so people like that can be compensated, licensed? Or, or, or is that even the right type of question to ask? No, that's absolutely the right question. And in fact, not only were we on the front line of giving healthy births, we black women have been on the front lines of drafting the policies to solve this maternal health crisis for the entire country. Last year, it, there was a suite of bills introduced called the Momnibus. And it was introduced by two black women in Congress, Lauren Underwood, who's a nurse and yes. a black woman out of Illinois, yes. Congresswoman Alma Adams, and it's 12 bills and it's, it's putting funding to training black midwives and doulas and midwives and doulas everywhere because rural areas also don't have the birthing infrastructure that they need. You know, going down and doing deeper training to up, unroot this uh, white supremacy that's in the medical field. It had a whole host of things, accountability for hospitals that continue to fail black women. And it was very close to passing. It actually got bundled up, Dr. Carr, into Build Back Better, right? And we know that mm-hmm. whole thing failed by one vote. So we're, we are at the front line, whether it's being the doulas and being the midwives, fighting to have access, to help our communities deliver, to designing the policies so that the resources can open up so our folks 
can have it so that you can use Medicaid to pay for your doula. Absolutely. And we saw Medicaid expansion uh, finally, I guess, was it North Carolina? In North Carolina. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, and, and it raises a question because it was that was that mansion. I think was that the one vote that stopped? Uh, <laughs> I guess it got tied up with, like you say, Build Back oh, Better. That was it. It was Joe Manchin uh, tanked uh, Build Back Better. So by one vote and in it, it had you had child care. We had, you know, wasn't quite universal child care, but it was getting close to what we see in other nations. It was paid family leave and there was a whole bunch of maternal health bills in there that were part of the Momnibus led by black women in Congress. And, and, and I'm glad you raised that. And we're going to take a break in a moment and when we come back. Can can we continue that conversation? Because one of the one of the very impressive things, among so many other things, about Moms Rising is that it is multiracial, it's intergenerational, it's wide ranging, it's organized at the state and local level. Um, and I wonder if you have any thoughts about how this type of coalition politics is probably the only way we'll be able to beat back those who would be opponents funded by lobbyists and all this kind of thing, and how people power can trump sometimes the power of the dollar, as we see it unleashed in in the federal legislation, among other places. Um, yeah, let, let, let's talk about that when we come back, because, again, people want to know what can we do. And that's why you're here today. You're going you're gonna to give us our marching order. So, <laughs> OK, so we'll be back right here at, in a moment here at the Black Table with Monifa and Moms Rising. And we're, we're really, really digging into this issue today. So I hope everybody's taking notes because we're getting some more numbers. Back at the Black Table. We feel the hidden impacts of climate change that land harder in black, brown, and native communities. Not many people talk about it because they clearly don't know our lives. But with President Biden's landmark infrastructure and climate plans, our issues are finally seen. Removing lead pipes means we know our water is safe. Cutting carbon pollution helps our kids breathe easier. 1.5 million new jobs mean stable work in communities. The impact we need. Right now. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Greg Carr, joined today by Monifa Akonwole Bandele, the uh, chief strategist for Moms Rising. And when we left, uh, we were talking about this question of policy and how policymaking is important. And I'm glad you raised both Lauren Underwood, of course, uh, who is a nurse, as you say, serves in the federal legislature, and also Alma Adams, who has been on the wall a long time out of North Carolina. We know her also for her work around HBCUs and supporting black colleges. Um, you know, given the coalition politics and given the, the broad base of Moms Rising, could you walk us through how this is a strength and kind of helps and then and what people can do at the local and state level to kind of push our elected representatives and, and you know how do we get to the point where it only failed by one vote and obviously we're going to come back and fight till it's passed because that's kind of work is passed. sometimes it's understated how important the state work is we're actually having victories in the states one of the victories i'm very happy to announce was medicaid expansion in north carolina and that came about because of a broad coalition of organizations um, moving and pushing the ball forward in that state. And Moms Rising in particular spent many days, many hours at the state capitol sharing stories of our members in the state across uh, rural to urban, across race, across class, saying that we want Medicaid expansion. And it's very important to build these multiracial coalitions because guess what in the United States? The largest voting demographic are white women, right? And we cannot just leave the largest voting demographic to their own devices, right? We have to push, we have to educate, and then we have to join forces to get the things that we want, specifically in policy fights, right? Maybe different in other arenas, but in this fight for policy. And Medicaid expansion is, is critical. I mean, for those in your audience who live in, in Georgia, where you see in hospitals closed down, Yes. And creating these vast deserts for health care is because the state refuses to accept uh, to expand Medicaid. Yes. Right. So one by one, 
we're shrinking the number of states that are not expanding Medicaid. This is money they could get, right? It's, 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 it's what the people there deserve and it will help bring down this maternal mortality rate across the board. Again, the racial disparities are not impacted by class and access, but our overall crisis as the United States is definitely impacted because we don't have this kind of like equity in our healthcare uh, structures. Mm. You, you've been working as we kind of teased at the beginning since really childhood uh, mm -hmm. you're there in the streets, in the communities, wherever you've been to, to engage work. And, and thinking about this in terms of the impact report that you all generated uh, last year, uh, one of the things that stood out to me was over 5,000 stories collected from members. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the phone calls and the online actions and the how important is people who we might think if we just read mass media that are open enemies, how important is it to for people to share stories? Like, like when you mentioned those rural hospitals, whether it be Mississippi or Georgia, these are people who say, well, they're voting against their class interests. Well, did you listen to them? Did you talk to them? How important is that on the ground work of human to human contact in this in this work to kind of help have people build coalition and, and move in our common interest? We're really able to expose the lies when we share stories. You know, you have a lot of lawmakers that come in and they say, well, my constituents don't want this and my constituents aren't suffering from this. And the data and the reports may show the opposite, but nobody reads that. Nobody reads no. these reports coming out of policy shops, except people in policy shops, right? Even the politicians aren't That's reading. Right. But when we bring it, we say, well, guess what? We've got five moms here from your district. We reached out, we found them. They're suffering. They want you to do something different. And then they're kind of, uh, 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 you know, they're, they're, you know they, they lose their train of thought because they were acting in the interest of business and corporations and trying to put the face of their constituents on there. Are there people that vote against their own interests? Absolutely. But there are also people in that community who are like me, I want Medicaid expansion. Me, I need mental health services for my kid. Me, I need different kinds of laws that will provide a care infrastructure instead of a criminalizing infrastructure. And we have to find those stories and those people. That's what we've been doing and join forces with them because it, it moved. The, you know, you had a lot of people who probably would have been with Joe Manchin to not vote for this package of bills. But you had less because we were finding stories in those districts and mobilizing those people to tell their leaders that they want something different. Stories speak louder than stats any day. Absolutely. You know, it's funny. I was uh, reading about uh, your mom's rising state mom forces with the meetups where people can talk about medical leave and paid sick days and things like that. I mean, like you say, we aren't where we want to be, but we're a lot further along. And you just wonder how in a state like West Virginia, for example, or a state like Kentucky, you know, how, how an elected official can face down living human beings, as you know better than I do. I mean, obviously work, working alongside folk like William Barber and Reverend Theo Harris and the Poor People's Campaign. You know, you know how, do, how do you reach a tipping point in, in this kind of struggle? When do you know you've reached a tipping point even before the bill reaches the desk of an executive to be signed? Can, is there a feeling you get? Is there a sense? I mean, because people want to know, well, you know, I understand bills, I understand legislation, but, you know, I get tired. I'm out here and I don't see anything. How have you been encouraged in those moments when you say, OK, we're, 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 we're it's connecting, we're making moves? We see because we talked about the state. Sometimes we see it moving on the local level. And that's really encouraging. People are passing ordinances and passing local laws that are consistent with our 10 top policy priorities. But I want to say this because I love this quote um, and I'm going to misquote him. But it, the essence of what uh, Dr. King was talking about, that when people are hungry, right, the white supremacist structure, instead of giving them food, they fed them Jim Crow. Right. And so you have some politicians in these states who are very, very skilled with saying, well, the reason why you are you are hungry um, to their constituents is because somebody in some other district is cheating the system. Mm. Somebody's, you know, using food stamps to buy a mansion, you know, and feeding into their racism, right? So it's confirmation bias. They, they too, are even though it may be poor and working, are white supremacists, right? And and allowing them to be fed 
off of this. Well, at least you're doing better off than these other people. And also you don't want to support these things because it's going to support these people who you believe. And I'm telling you, you should believe are, are cheating the system. And so then they fight against an infrastructure that people have all over the world. Right. And, and they want to label it uh, socialism. And that's a whole nother show we can have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like this is absolutely not socialism. You know, you want to tell us what we, you want to know what we really want. That's another conversation. This is just to open up access to some basic needs that and any society should have for folks. So we feel that there's a tipping point when we start to really see those um, those stories come in, when people show up, just like we see with Dr. Barbara, when we have rallies at these state capitals, people will show up with their kids. Yes. And so they say, I can't get child care. So I'm going to bring these kids with me mm. to testify about why don't we have a uh, child care infrastructure in this state? Why is, in some states child care costs more than college? Absurd. That's ridiculous. Absurd. That's absurd. Can, can we, can we, uh, as we kind of uh, drive toward the next break, but can we spend a minute talking about funding? I mean, one of the things I know, one of the 10 policy items that are priorities for, for, for moms is, is the federal budget. And we know, of course, state and local budget has its own challenges. I mean, you know, how do we attack the question of repurposing resources, our tax dollars? I mean, we pay into these systems. Absolutely. Another one of the amazing women, black women, Congress women that I want to shout out is uh, Cori Bush. Right. And so she has introduced she introduced last year. She reintroduced it, the People's Response Act. And she's saying, let's let's repurpose the resources that we keep putting into systems of harm, carceral systems, all these things that we know is not working and use that money to build up public health, to build up real public safety, right? To get organizations that know how to do diffuse violence before it happens instead of dealing with it after it show, after it show up, show up after it happens like the police, right? And so the People's Response Act kind of reimagines federal funds and helps to direct states to put it into systems that make communities safe before the fact, that prevent violence, that prevent the traumas and the tragedies. And that's the type of vision um, and visionaries that we are supporting at Moms Rising. And, it, and there's, there's, there's many of them across the country um, that are in Congress and also in these state houses. Excellent. When we come back, um, if you don't mind, I want to maybe cover a few more of the mm -hmm. policy areas that Moms Rising is, is targeting and, and maybe even raise an issue that is on all of our minds in the wake of the recent shooting in Nashville, my hometown, right down the street from where I went to high school. Wow. And yeah, the Cub at the Covenant School. And I know that uh, ending gun violence and certainly stemming the tide of violence that comes from that is one of the priorities of, of Moms Rising. So when we come back, let, let's talk about that and some of the other policy initiatives. We're with the Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for Moms Rising, our sister Monifa Akamwale Bandele. We'll be back here at the Black Table in a moment. Folks, Black Star Network is here. A real uh, revolutionary right now. Wow. Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rolling. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm your regular host, Greg Carr. Remember to support the Black Table. To support all of the shows on the Black Star Network, join the Bring the Funk fan club, tell a friend. We are global and getting stronger every day. 
And shows like this are an excellent example of why you need to support the Black Star Network. We are joined once again by Senior Vice President, Chief Strategy Officer Monifa Akonwole Bandele, who is leading us through this action agenda item of Moms Rising. Uh, go to momsrising.org to see the full policy statements, to see the impact of Moms Rising, to join the volunteer, do everything, learn how to register to vote, to how you can get involved on this local level. Um, Monifa, the, the question of gun, gun violence, as, as I mentioned, um, it seems as if those who are recalcitrant, who are either in the pocket of the lobby or lobbies or, or whatever, are saying, yeah, this is a tragedy, thoughts, prayers, and let's keep it moving. How do we uh, uh, hit this this issue? I mean, how do we attack this issue? Yeah, this is, this is one for the books. Um, I believe this is one of the areas of policy work where I've learned the most. Mm. Uh, we were doing this work before the massacre at Sandy Hook. And when Sandy Hook happened, you know, um, conventional wisdom would say that this will be the sea change, right? This will be where we get the national leaders, national elected leaders to really act, right? There's gonna be congressional action here. This is a slaughter of children um, in Connecticut, you know, children from a privileged community, all the things we could think of, we were like, yes. and nothing can get past, right? And so when we really look at the history of the opposition and what we're up against, you know, the NRA didn't become like this lobbying gun rights organization until the eighties. Prior to that, it was about, you know, people and their hobbies and, you know, this is how you get a gun and, 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 you know, just really almost like a sporting club, right? So it becomes like this political entity right around the time when you see um, us moving into the, um, the crime bill, you know, the war on drugs, you know, all of this stuff is kind of all happening together. So at the same time that you have uh, this hyper criminalization of our movement, right, coming out of the, the 70s and the backlash on all of the care infrastructure that had been won during a particular era, this, these narratives around the welfare queen, you see all this policing and you see this vigilanteism, right? And you see the NRA coming in and holding fast to the second amendment and this idea that we have to arm citizens. You know, it's, it was it almost feels like uh, the backlash of reconstruction, right? We gotta yes. be armed and we have to be, have these militias Absolutely. in place and we have to have a political arm that, that um, backs that up. And so we're really up against a decades old, you know, political lobbying group that has a lot of power, has a lot of people in their pockets. And sadly, even the lives of children don't matter to them. Mm -hmm. but, but I want to say that when you look at the work that policymakers are doing, like Cori Bush, yes. people on the ground, Black men, Black women who are leading organizations to fight violence in communities. I'm in, I'm in New York. I'm in Brooklyn, New York. There's Erica Ford in Queens. You know, she has Peace is a Lifestyle. We have A.T. Mitchell in Brooklyn with Man Up. We have SOS. We see our community building a grassroots, you know, response to the gun violence and trying our best always to not only fight for the policies to win the solutions, but then like building our own solutions, mm -hmm. you know, on the ground, which we, we learned from the from the Black Panther Party, Republican New Africa, all of our elders they started initiatives. Kids are hungry. We're going to feed. We're going to do a breakfast program. Yes. If no first responders, we'll do black ambulances, you know, in Pittsburgh. You know, we see these experiments. We study about them and we're like, OK, we can do that, too. So all's not lost, but it's just really amazing. Uvalde, you know, what just happened in your hometown just goes to show that it is profits over people and mm -hmm. not just profits over people like me and you, even our children. That's right. And even all children in That's the country. Right. That's right. You know, again, and, 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 and we, we listen, we're thrilled that you've joined us this first time. We're looking forward to having you on over and over again, because in many ways you represent that essential blending of self-determination, cultural, not only awareness, but beingness, standing in our full selves and reaching out and building and connecting based on our common humanity across 
uh, across racial lines, across gender, across all the, the lines that we are that often try to divide us or used to try to divide us. Uh, as you're talking about gun violence, of course, think about this recent Supreme Court case, which is, you know, overturned that hundred year old plus law on carrying weapons there in New York. But it also reminds me that you have a deep experience with this multi pronged struggle strategy, which includes the courts. I'm thinking about, of course, Floyd versus City of New York, where, where you triumphed in terms of, of stop and frisk. You know, how important is it to blend all of these strategies? Because oftentimes, you know, we hear people say it all the time, I'm not going to vote or I'm not building with that person. Do you have to give up any of who you are in order to engage in multi-pronged strategy and coalition building and whether it's the courts, the ballot box, the streets, you know, it, it, do you, when people say that they can't do this or the other thing, how important is it to employ this multi-pronged strategy to, to achieve these victories? What I ask people is that's like, don't you see the multi-pronged approach to keep you down? Like when you go, ah, you, oh, that's bars. Let me, I got it right yeah. <laughs> When you're stopped and frisked by the police, when you get to work, you're paid less. When you try to access childcare, you can't afford it. When you go to the hospital, you're not treated. Feel, is that not a multi prong approach, you know, to kind of keep you boxed in to being a laborer, a producer for gains outside of you, your family, your community? Like, what else is there? So if we think that it has to be either or in how we fight back, we're always going to be missing, you know, part of what's coming at us. And so that's the piece we get stuck in. It's like it's either or, you know, it's either in the streets or it's in the courts or it's in the city hall or it's at the state capitol. And we're like, no, first of all, there's enough of us to do all those things. We have skills in all those places and everybody can fight where they are. One of the most um I think emotionally inspiring moments of the uprisings in June of 2020 for me was some of the responses that we saw from labor. We were having daily protests in and around Juneteenth, right in downtown Brooklyn, and it was happening everywhere, Minneapolis, Oakland, all over the country. And we know on Juneteenth, there was rallies in every state in the nation. And I'm talking about the, of course, the movement for black lives, or if you want to call it the Black Lives Matter movement protests specifically, and we were being, and even in New York City, they put a curfew in place, which we never had before, right? <laughs> yes, yes. But then they would corral the, the, the protesters in before curfew. Then you're trapped in for curfew and then arrest people, mass mm -hmm. arrests. There was just a, several lawsuits won here in New York and in Philly recently. And one day, I'll never forget it. We had to, they had, the, they were arresting so many people, you couldn't put them all in police cars. They had mm -hmm. to commandeer city buses to take people to central booking, right? Mm -hmm. And on this one day near Juneteenth, we saw as people were being corralled into the buses, the bus drivers all stepped off the buses. Wow. They refused to drive, the buses were lined up on Flatbush. Wow. Cops can't drive buses. And they wow. sent out a tweet. They said, we are we're the transit workers union. We are not yes. the NYPD. <laughs> and then we saw it happen in Minneapolis and you saw it happen in Oakland. So you're a bus driver. You don't have to drive policy. Maybe you didn't go to city hall, but you stood in your power, which is your union, and you said no. And yes. people had to be let go that day. They could not get people from Barclay Center to central booking, right? And you saw that labor had had this conversation and they said, what can we do? Well, we, everyone is in that position, whether you're a mm -hmm. nurse, doctor, wh whatever it is your lane is, you can be a part of the both and. That's powerful. That is so powerful. It reminds me of something that uh, I heard you all quote, and now we can hear him voice to voice since uh, you have helped lead the effort to free Dr. Matula Shakur. Something Dr. Shakur said, you know, the people will decide when I am released, not the state. You've given us such an example. People can make a decision from where they are. That is, that, that is, that, that's remarkable. Um, and I know we're going to talk about that in, 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 our, in our last block, you know, how you've come to this moment. And we're going to talk about political prisoners. I'm wondering there in the, in the People's Republic of Brooklyn, as, as we hear people call it uh, reverentially, uh, this <laughs> this incredible borough of some seem like one of every type of human being on the planet. I know moms uh, deals as well with the question of immigration. Um, I know that's something that, of course, you all have experienced firsthand growing up in a city and in a borough that is primarily immigrants. 
for, for lack of a better term. I mean, more recent immigrants. So obviously, we all got caught up in the criminal enterprise. But, you know, how, how important is it for us to really place immigration at the center of what so often in this country becomes a kind of domestic conversation where we look at us versus them and you see people lining up against other people like, what are you doing? I know, it's just so divisive. And we have to remember, which we always remember in Brooklyn is that they're black immigrants, right? Yes. When we go into these immigrant uh, rights coalitions and campaigns, we see like, it's like the black immigrants are invisible. And, you know, I think it's really important and part of our strategy at Moms Rising is to put that first, put that to the forefront, that for every community that there is, there's someone who is an immigrant that looks like you, right? Because we know how we got here different different ways and different <laughs> from different places, but they're black immigrants and they're in our community, they're our neighbors, they're our families. You know, we were fighting, it was just so painful how we had to fight for TPS, for uh, Haitians, Temporary Protective Services. And, that, and we have to highlight that there is a difference for black immigrants, not only in the treatment at the border that we saw last year where they were using uh, horse reins yes. uh, to whip people, you know, back to the other side of the border, but also in the policies that we have coming uh, across the various ways that you come into the country. And so that's one of the things we have to do is uplift those stories. I talk to black people all the time and you would think they didn't know that they were black immigrants. When you talk about immigrants, you're like, yes. what? <laughs> That is remarkable. You know, it's interesting. A few years ago, and I want to say, and you all know that um, the the Akinwole Bandeles are black through and through. They're, one of their oldest is one of our students at Howard, and then she might have been in school at that point. Her name might have been uh, Stephen Horsford came to campus around this issue of black immigrants, member of Congress. And, and and students were surprised how many members of the Congressional Black Caucus in the federal legislature are actually from, or like Ilhan Omar, obviously, but, or the daughters or sons of Africans who came from other places. And, and Clark, you, I mean, it's a long list. Yvette Clark was there, in fact, yes. <laughs> There's our freedom fighters. You know, we think about uh, Stokely Carmichael. We were watching a new documentary, The Family Was, uh, um, Black Power the, in, the, in Lowndes County. Oh, Lowndes County, of course. Oh, that's perfect. And like, he's, she's from Trinidad, you know. Yeah, about that. But, but I tell you, the brother from Louisiana, I, I, maybe I missed him. Uh, did, did, did we see uh, Imam Al Amin? I didn't see H Rap. Brown in it. But, in the, but exactly. actually, we're going to come back to this. Okay. <laughs> That's our point of entry for the final segment. We're going to talk about the fact that we need to, in the great words of Amari Obadelli and some of you, free them all. <laughs> so we're going to talk about political prisoners with, with our last segment here with uh, with our sister Monifa Akonwole Bandele here on the Black Table here at the Black Star Network. Um, Y'all better call a friend because this conversation you're not going to hear it anywhere else but it is vital to what we are doing as humans in the world today. Back in the moment. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Remember to support all the shows on the Black Star Network. Join the Bring the Funk fan club and uh, tell a friend wherever you are, not only in the U.S., but in the world. So we're back here with our final segment for now of our inaugural conversation here at the Black Table with Manifa Akinwole Bandele. And I was reading an article, you and your comrade, partner, husband, another legendary freedom fighter, Lumumba, wrote in the new uh, publication by our friend and brother, Robin Kelly. We know you just spent some time talking with him on, on Haymarket about this issue of souls I'm going to ask you about. But this this article that you all wrote, and it's available digitally, y'all. Y'all go to hammerandhope.org. 
why we work to free political prisoners of the black power era. You've done an incredible amount of work. As I mentioned before, we went um, in, into conversation today. I just saw uh, Baba A.K. Akinyele Umoja out of uh, Atlanta, Florida. And of course, one of your comrades in Malcolm X Grassroots Coalition, pulling on that to the New African People's Organization, then to the Mighty Republic of New Africa. I want so much I want to ask you. Really want to ask you about the East, too. We might have to come back and ask the, you know, Baba Jit, too. And then new cats, man, y'all out of the East. You make me, you look, we used to just worship the ground y'all walked on. But this, this journal uh, dedicated, uh, uh, especially to your souls, dedicated to Baba Matulu Shakur, Dr. Matulu mm -hmm. Shakur. You know, why, what is a black political prisoner, uh, Monifa, and why should we be working so hard to free them all? Well, here's an important piece because we just talked about gun violence. There are incidents when gun policy can be passed swiftly. And that's when you hey. see resistance movements of black people, of indigenous people and black people armed. So some of the first gun laws that we saw passed swiftly was when the Black Panther Party staged a protest, as we know, in Sa Sacramento, California. It's an iconic photo, right? They come in and they have guns. And then all of a sudden there's all of these these gun control laws in place. Right. And so I raised that story because. It's important to know how important our freedom fighters are to the opposition, right? To, yes. to, to, to the, the structures that are trying to keep us in this like status quo. And so that should help to inform you how important they are to us, that we have to know about them. We have to know about the experiments that they did that at that time informed public policy, right? Around everything from hunger to health to community safety, and that we're cut off from it for the same reasons that black history is under attack right now, that critical race theory is under attack right now, that any truth in education is under attack is because it inspires you to really envision a different world and change it. What started me working on the, uh, well, really I knew about political prisoners before this, but the inspiration I got was when I traveled to Cuba, I was very young, to the World <laughs> Youth Festival. Yes. It was in 1997 or 98, can't remember. Mm. And we met two sisters there, Nahanda Abiodun and Asada Shakur. Mm. And sitting with people who had accomplished so much, you know, we couldn't even fathom that you could be in a prison one day in New Jersey. And now you're sitting and talking to us. Yes. You know, in, a, in another age, another nation under political asylum, a black woman. Yes. You know, and there were hundreds of us. It was like 800 uh, youth from the United States and tens of thousands from all over the world. And it was inspiring. So it was like, OK, we can do things but we haven't seen. If if Matulu Shakur, who one of his charges was liberating Asada Shakur from prison and Sundiata and, and Sekou Odinga could do this. Yes. Then surely we can go back and pass some policies. Surely we can go back and uh, launch campaigns to free them from prison. And that's when we really rolled up our sleeves and started working on this hardcore. We started a Black August hip hop project, which I think yes. most people know, Lamumba and I. And for 10 years, artists like Common, you know, Mostaf, Talib Kweli, The Roots, Erica Baidu, we had these annual events. We're from the stage, you know, our popular cultural icons were saying, free Matulu Shakur, free Mumia Abu Jamal. Help, help me with this, uh, because I, I want to make sure I didn't misunderstand this. You all had, before he signed the big deals, Biggie? We had Biggie. This is, see, young people, oh, big, what? Biggie was talking about free political print. Please help us understand how this people's movement, you don't have to be out there at red, black, and green every day. Tell us about, because this is the golden age of hip hop, right? This was the, yeah. This was like late 90s is when we launched it. But before we even did the first Black August concert, we did a concert the year before we went to Cuba with Biggie on Matula Shakur. Wow. You know, because it's both and. Yes. You can both be doing deep political education with people of like minds, but if you don't have a strategy for the rest of our folks who aren't there yet or who maybe are not of like mind, then we can't win. Yes. And and Biggie was with it. That's the whole thing, too. It was like, so this is what happened, and this is why these people are in prison, and this was RNA, and between the RNA, which the Republican New Africa, Black Panther Party, and the Black Liberation Army, 
we got all these black elders that are political prisoners. And Biggie was like, oh, bet. The people understand. That's beautiful. That is beyond. And he, and he did a show beautiful. right here in Brooklyn for Matilda. That is Street. incredible. And, and 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 people are listening, and we think these odds are insurmountable. But even though, as you say, like Rochelle Sinke McGee, who are another one helping Asada get out of the clutches, you know, remains behind bars. And as you say, with this new documentary out, uh, we don't see Jamil Alamein profile the way he should. The great H rap brand who remains. However, there's a long list of Africans who have been liberated as a consequence of this work. And could you talk a little bit about the victories and what some of the work that remains to be done? Yeah, the victories, the victories have been coming in um, over these last couple of years. So say Kuo Denga, who I mentioned, um, got out. And this was like, this was the year we call it the Mike Brown year when Ferguson went up. Yes. <laughs> like we, we were infusing free say Kuo Denga in that work. Uh, and he, he came out, I never forget it to like there was protests in the street here in New York around Eric Garner when he came home. But mm -hmm. since then, um, just last year, Sundiata Coley, who was a Sada Shakur's co-defendant, who people said would never. People would tell us all the time, Sundiata's never getting out. Sekou's never getting out. He's home. He's home with his family. So we learned from them because they never gave up and they dreamed the impossible. And we kept at it and we kept getting more and more people on board to support them until we had that right combination, right, of support to, to get them through the door. And the remaining six, as we named them in that article of Hammer and Hope, they're not all the political prisoners that they are, but these are the six from our Black Power Movement that remain, elders from the Black Power Movement, which is, of course, uh, Jam Imam Jamil Alameen, Rochelle McGee, you have um, Kamal Siddiqui, you have Ed Poindex, you have Mumia Abu-Jamal, right? And you have Alonzo. So you have these six that still come out of those same formations that we're fighting for. And then as we're doing that, we see the arrests at Cop City, yeah. right? We see another wave where the same tactics are being used to shut down protests and, you know, political opposition um, to to oppression. So it's really important that we not only uplift them, but that's why we wrote the article to share the examples of how you fight these campaigns. Thank you. And we'll drop a link to that article and also to this remarkable special issue of Souls, Free the Land, Free the People, the Political Significance of Dr. Shakur's Legacy, Matulu Shakur. Um, as you I want to talk about Matulu. Come on, let's spin this leg. Come on now, let's do it. This last moment because talk to us. Talk to us. <laughs> we mentioned about you know his freedom fighting, him his liberating Asada Shakur from prison, but Matulu Shakur built out internal community public health systems. Hmm. So we know right now we hear talks about the opioid crisis, and then when I was a kid, it was like you know the crack crisis. But Matulu Shakur, when the community was was really in a deep crisis around drug addiction, built out community clinics. They built out community clinics to detox folks using acupuncture and acupressure. Right. And then trained an army of people. And these clinics still exist in some form or another. The people that he trained continue to save our people. You know, we have a clinic up in Harlem where the folks running it, they're like, we were trained by Dr. Shakur. <laughs> right. So these examples to us, when we are out here in the streets talking about abolition and we say, well, we keep us safe. And people say, well, then who are we going to call? It's us. We're yeah. going to call us. That's yeah. the lesson of Dr. Matulu Shakur. He said, who are you, you going to pick up the phone? You're going to call yourself. He saw mm -hmm. that the community was struggling. He, he went and learned how to detox folks. He trained dozens of people, if not hundreds, on how to do it. And they built a clinic to save lives. Absolutely. This is um, it's so powerful because it brings it full circle. Even in just this hour we've had, uh, the work that you're doing with Moms Rising, the work around maternal justice, around uh, workplace justice, around health care, universal health care, all of these things, and to hear Dr. Matula Shakur freed by the people, the pressure of the people, um, having been not only grounded in that, but continue to have impact, it really does bring it full circle. Um, how can folks who are watching this saying, I'm, I'm reinvigorated now, I really want to get involved, how, how can they get involved directly with some of the work that Moms Rising is doing? I don't know if you want to say anything about any other links you want to yes. help people understand, please. 
definitely want to repeat momsrising.org. I know everyone listening out there has a story to tell. Um, we always say that Moms Rising is for everyone who is a mother or who had a mother, right? So mm. that's everybody. That's me too. So you, have, you have something to share, um, a story to share and a way to help us put the our 10 policy priorities in place. In terms of joining the fight to free the six political prisoners, you know, you can go to the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement's website, follow our handles at mxgm.org. There's a whole list of all kinds of political prisoners on the Jericho Movement website. But I also ask people, getting out isn't easy and starting a life to support Dr. Matulu Shakur by going to freematulushakur.com. And we should make sure to drop that in the chat too, because yes. he's taking donations and support to deal with his own health after having built institutions to help our health. We absolutely will do that. We, in fact, one of the things that Akin Yearly has said that you all came out of pocket to make a few print copies of this and that they're going to be sold. And I said, AK, let me know how much, man. We're going to push that because we have to absolutely put that floor up under uh, Dr. Shakur, like uh, Paul, Carf our brother Paul Coates did for his friend and brother Eddie Conway. I mean, you yeah. got to make sure <laughs> when you come out that we're taken care of. This has really been a blessing for us, uh, and I want to thank you. Thank you. Thank the family. And when you come back, you have to tell us about some of these roots because your roots with the Black Panthers go back and your roots with the cultural freedom fighters of several generations go back, you and your husband. And so love to you and to Lumumba, to the girls, to everyone. And uh, and thank you. Thank you. For Shout out to our parents. We were born Please. into this, you know. No we'll question. talk about it next time. We definitely will. And shout out to our sister, April Silver, always on the wall. She made sure that we made this connection. And, and we're going to have you back soon because we just scratched the surface. So uh, we'll be back in a moment to clear the table. We've had a conversation today with our sister, Monifa Akinwole uh, Bandele, who is the Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer for Moms Rising, sits at the policy table for the Movement for Black Lives and is and does so much more than that. But uh, you heard it here at the Black Table. So uh, let's get involved. We'll be back in a moment to clear the table. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn lives. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at every university calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. There's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Remember to support the Black Star Network. Join the Bring the Funk fan club. Tell a friend, tell two friends, tell a whole bunch of people. We need your support, and you can see why after today's conversation with Manifa Akonwole Bandele. We talked about a lot today, how to intervene and to create a better world through policy, through voting, through organizing, through protesting, through everything from fundraising to lobbying. There's no one way to make a better society. You heard today from a freedom fighter who, as she says, was born into the struggle. She, her husband, their children, 
from a long line of Black Panthers and revolutionary Pan-Africanists who was involved in a multiracial, multi-class coalition to improve the lives of every human that walks the planet. It is a powerful reminder that it is not either or in the struggle to create a better world. It's got to be both and. And so with that in mind, we're going to pause for a week and we'll see you next time here at the Black Table on the Black Star Network. Thank you.